finding uh, grain materials, pressing olives, wine, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, Romans, of course, ate just like us. Now, they had a lot of differences, though. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the food they ate. We're making one that's kind of a dessert. Romans had a big sweet tooth. Uh, now, of course, if you were Roman, you didn't have the same things we had. Now, when you guys think of uh, Italian food, what do you think? Spaghetti, right? What kind of sauce? Pizza. What kind of sauce is on all of these? Tomato sauce, right? Italians love tomato sauce. So, Romans. Ancient Romans, right? Do those Italians have pasta and tomato sauce? In 79 AD? If you look at context. Now, if you don't know about history, maybe you haven't studied too much of it yet, but Rome, uh, you know, went from, I don't know when they were founded, but we're talking maybe 200 BC to about 4 something AD. Uh, so we're talking about a thousand years before Christopher Columbus. And Christopher Columbus was the one that brought tomatoes back to Europe. Uh, so there were no tomatoes in Europe. They were a new world food. Uh, and even when tomatoes got to Europe, nobody wanted them. Tomatoes are related to nightshade. And everyone thought they were poisonous. So nobody ate tomatoes. Uh, Italian food didn't really start having tomato sauce until 16, 1700. So no tomato sauce. Uh, what about pasta? Where's the noodle from? Pasta noodle. It's a tough one. You gotta know a little bit about food history. Yeah, China is the most common uh, thought. Nobody really knows. Uh, but we do know the Chinese eat noodles, and then after the Silk Road, and um, Marco Polo opened that up in the 1400s, right? Or just forget Marco Polo. Um, a lot of bread. A lot of bread. In fact, if you were a Roman citizen, you were guaranteed free bread uh, as a part of your citizenship. So um, this is a type of bread. Now, when you guys check out Pompeii, there's something really cool. You get this kind of back corner. There's a loaf of bread that's over 2,000 years old. Uh, the baker put it in the oven. The volcano erupted. The baker didn't make it. Uh, the bread wasn't taken out of the oven for 2,000 years. Um, and, and now it's just a piece of charcoal that's been carbonized by the, the heat from the volcano. Uh, but still, it's really cool. It's an actual loaf of bread. So, uh, there's different kinds of bread. Who bakes? Anyone bake? What do you put in your bread to make it rise? Yeast, right? Or if you're making a quick bread, like a... Uh, uh, or something, what do you put in there? Baking soda, right? Or baking powder, one of those will make it rush. So it's called leavening, it's called leavened bread, right? This is an unleavened bread. It does not have anything to make it fry. Flat bread would be an unleavened bread, right? Like a vegan. Actually, I think naan does have a little baking powder. A tortilla would be an unleavened bread. Um, so the Romans had both. Uh, but to get leavening back then, you could just go buy a package of yeast. Uh, who's ever tried making a sourdough before? It's really hard. I'm gonna try that. You gotta build a starter where the yeast eats the sugar and releases CO2 over time. Natural occurring yeast. You'll just add yeast to it. The yeast occurs from nature. It takes months. So they ate that, but they also had a lot of unleavened bread. So this is a, like I said, this is a cheese bread. It's a really curious recipe. Uh, the ingredients are ricotta cheese. So if you don't have dairy, then you can't have this. It's like two pounds of ricotta cheese. Uh, a pound of flour. Now the Romans didn't have all purpose baking flour, so I'm using wheat flour, which the Romans would not have wheat. And then an egg. So we beat the egg into this flour and ricotta mix, and you make these little loaves. And then you bake them on top of a bay leaf, which is really curious. Uh, if you ever had a bay leaf, uh, they're really interesting flavor. Um, and that's kind of probably what we're smelling, but it infuses into the, the bread. And then we're gonna try something funny. The Romans would have eaten this savory without the honey or sweet with the honey. But I like it with the honey, and they did it with a big sweet tooth. Uh, and bees, beekeeping was really, uh, really pretty advanced by the time Rome came around. The Egyptians, uh, as far as we know, were the first ones to start beekeeping. Um, and the Romans continued the tradition. They loved honey. They had no sugar. There was sugar in the Middle East, but the Romans had a hard time getting it, and they didn't really use cane sugar in any way that we would think. Um, so this, it's interesting, it's not like a sweet cake, uh, it's more of like a sponge bread, it's hard to describe, but I hope you like it, it gets a nice crust on it, I've been surprised every time I've made it, how tasty it is. So when we talk about Roman food, we like to hear the weird stuff that you hear, um, all the strange things they did, the strange things they ate. If you haven't studied Rome yet, Fahrenheit, in order for it to keep a liquid phase, anything above that, is going to start to boil and evaporate. 
So let's take it to this container that has a balloon attached to it. We have our boiling liquid. So what's going to happen once I go around the top of this container? That's right, the balloon inflates. So the gas takes up over 650 times more space than the liquid. So a really little bit of liquid goes a pretty long way towards inflating that balloon. Now let's try it the other way around. Let's blow up a balloon the old-fashioned way. You'll have to give me a second here. So if I tie a knot at the end of this balloon, can I add any more air to it? No. no. Can I take air away from it? Yes. How can I do that? Pop it. I can pop it. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take the entire thing and dunk it in the liquid nitrogen. And I don't think that it will pop. Let's see. Let me get my gloves back on. Safety first. You don't want to get this stuff on your skin or your eyes. It will not be very pleasant. All right, so here's our balloon. A little bit too big to fit in the container. I'm going to blow it up a little bit too much. It's in the nitrogen. It's getting colder bit by bit because we're not very much nitrogen today. What's happening to the balloon? It's cold as it will. When we talk about things like the energy atoms and molecules have, atoms and molecules are the basic building block of matter, whether something's a solid or liquid or a gas. When they have a lot of heat energy, they move around quite a lot. So they take up a lot of space in their container when they're sealing that balloon. When they lose heat energy, the balloon starts to shrink, not because you've lost any air, but because those air molecules are moving slower, so they're all sort of tightly packed together. But if you leave anything inflatable outside in the winter, you'll see the same sort of effect. There we go. So that got a little smaller, crinkled up a little bit, but it didn't pop, and we didn't uh, untie it. So there's the same amount of air in here, just shrinks and gets a little bit smaller as it gets cold. Now, let's see what else we can try here. Hopefully this thing will get cold enough. Tell me, in outer space, is it warm or is it cold? cold. Pretty cold, right? Maybe next to the sun and I'm sure it's warm there. For the most part, it gets pretty cold. So when you're sending materials into space, that means you have to test out how they behave here on the Earth, and preferably before you spend millions of dollars on a satellite, test out how it will act in that environment once it actually gets up there. Let me get my camera ready here. Uh, what are pennies made out of? Copper. Copper. What are the metals do? Start with a Z. Zinc. And copper and zinc. Uh, so they had to start making them out of copper and zinc because the price of copper got so high that it cost more than a penny to make a penny, which is obviously bad news. Uh, so they changed it to copper zinc back in 1986. These days it actually still costs more than a penny to make a penny, so maybe they'll change the recipe again. But a stress test is nice and simple. I'm going to take the hammer and hit the penny over and over again and see what happens. That uh, might be a little bit loud, you're welcome to cover yours if you want to. Alright, how's it look? Pretty much the same. Uh, so pennies are a malleable material, that means that they can bend into a new shape, you can bend a penny. I don't think we have those penny stretching machines that you see in a lot of museums anymore, but we certainly used to. And those work because you're able to stretch out the material of the penny and do a new shape. Well, let's try the penny that's here with the nitrogen. Again, I hope this one will get cold enough for us today. We've got the same material, sitting in a bit of nitrogen there. Let's pour it out of the block and test out copper and zinc at a low temperature. All right, that didn't take very much. And it did, in fact, get cold enough, so I'm happy. Uh, so it is a federal offense to destroy currency, so don't tell us. But you're able to destroy a penny really easily at low temperatures because that material isn't malleable anymore. It doesn't stretch and bend out of the way, of course. It's brittle, so it just has to absorb all of the pressure of that hammer, which is going to cause it to crack and break a lot of the time. Now, I only had a penny today, uh, but you can try this out with other types of currency. Nickels survive, uh, and I suppose they're still made out of at least parts of nickels. They make a nice recipe on those ones, too. Uh, you can break a euro with enough force, and those are made out of steel. So I'm getting on the EU's bad side too, breaking their currency. Well, let's see. I've got a couple other solid objects in here. Let's try this one first. So I've got a racket ball made out of rubber, so it should be pretty bouncing. At low temperatures, rubber undergoes a bit of a change. I'll leave that for a little bit later. So before this gets too warm, I'm going to put this through a stress test too. Let's see if I can break this one. Ready? I know, I end up with a broken thumb for a broken racquetball. There we go. That took a little bit of work, but 
but we got somewhere. Let's see if we crank the form. Let's do just a little bit more. So I think on this one, only one side got cold enough to crack. Rubber has to be below negative 103 degrees Fahrenheit in order to take on a brittle property instead of being elastic and stretchy and bendable. So I think this side got cold enough to crack. It's just a little bit warmer than dry ice, that 103 temperature threshold. But this side didn't break. It's probably still a little bit softer, a little bit more elastic. And just for the sake of science, we can test out the warm racket ball too. What'll happen with this one? Steps right up. Do this all day. This would not break. It's elastic, so it stretches out of the way, of course, really easily. And then let's try our last one with liquid nitrogen here before I get some of my other stuff. Let's see whether this one works. I've got another solid object here, pewter cup. Pewter is a metal a combination of tin and lead, so it's pretty easy to bend it into a new shape, and it retains that shape. That's a malleable feature again. But we really want to test this one. Let's see whether we can turn it into a musical instrument. Shape like a bell. Let's hang it over the hammer. Try and give it a good ring. We've got the same material, pewter. I get asked sometimes whether it's safe to drink out of pewter because it is partially made out of lead. Uh, the short answer is that it is safe as long as it's not deteriorating. The people still have pewter drinking cups. There we go. So just let me talk about it. When things get colder, they tend to become denser. Those molecules lose heat energy, so they're packed together in one space. And that just happens to make it so that our vibration can travel through these pewter molecules much more easily and make a ringing sound resonate with the air inside. So then with that, I am pretty confident that's all of my liquid nitrogen. So let's see what else I have out here for you guys. Has anyone ever seen what happens when you put Mentos in a Diet Coke? Some fruit Mentos. The reason why this experiment works so well Sort of a funny one. It's not a chemical reaction, it's actually a physical reaction. If you were to put Mentos under a microscope and examine them very closely, they're covered in these little holes, almost like the dimples on a golf ball, called nucleation sites. And when you drop it into soda, the carbonation tries to flow to those nucleation sites, but it basically has the effect of stirring this stuff up all at once. And so there's your geyser of soda. Uh, all of that carbonation released all at once. Different candies out here that we're going to try. We want to see whether any of them work better than the Mentos. We might find ourselves a new standard for Diet Coke explosions. So first, let's open up another Coke. Let's try Sour Patch Kids. So, does anyone think Sour Patch Kids will create a higher geyser than Mentos? No. No, not a whole lot of confidence in the Sour Patch Kids today. So let's get three. When you're conducting the experiment, you only want one thing to change if possible. What do you want to change when you're conducting the experiment? Independent variable. So we want to change our candy. We want that to be our independent variable. We don't want to use a different size of soda, a different type of soda. We don't want to use a different amount of candy. I put in three Mentos, I'm going to put in three Sour Patch Cakes. Let's hope these don't drop through the gap. My guys are too before I'm ready. Right. Now those ones just fit in there. And they're stacked together like that. Look at the countdown from three. Ready? Three, two, one. So does anybody think we're just using our uh, senses today, no official measuring tool? Anyone think that went higher or lower than the Mentos? Higher. Higher. So there's another way that you can test this stuff out too, especially once the bubbles in this settle a little bit. Our dependent variable is what we're measuring in our experiment. So our dependent variable could be the height of the geyser. It depends on and changes with the independent variable. You can also measure something else. You can measure maybe how much soda is left in the container afterwards and sort of measure how much was jettisoned out in that geyser there. That's another way you can test it out, but I think we're going to stick with geyser height. That's always a good way to do it. All right, now next up, let's try some spice drops. We're going to find a soda. 
Does anybody name spice drops? We'll go higher than Mentos. These are like, they're off brand gumdrops. So they, one of the things they might have going for them is that they're covered in a coating, sort of like the Sour Patch Kids were. Uh, but we'll see. I'm sure there's a different recipe that goes into this. Little jelly candies. Let's get three of them. There we go. One, two, three. Guys, two of them. Good beans. Spice drops. It's a good performance for a Kroger brand candy, I guess. <laughs> brand care too much about science experiment and guys' height. So now next, last candy that I want to try are lifesavers. So there's a bit of a problem with lifesavers though, that they are too big to really fit in these geyser tubes. Which means I gotta bring back my hammer, yeah. My smashing block. Take any excuse. Break something up. Let's do this side. Yep. I appreciate the person who, years ago, gave me the wonderful advice of break them in the back. That way they don't go flying all over the room. So let's go ahead and try and load this up in our last geyser tube. Let's see. This one. There we go. So again, I'm trying to keep as many things constant as possible in here. So for example, I have to take a few to put on here. Ideally, you just have a full fourth one, but I don't want to put these candies into a wet geyser tube. I don't think that would give them a very fair shot if they were getting a uh, soda full of ready. And even though I've broken these up into a lot smaller pieces, what I'm looking for in here trying to stick to three units of candy, however the company that makes the term is that. So this is what Lifesaver says in three Lifesavers, minus a few little shards. Both are introduced, and in a perfect world, you'd be able to eliminate. Stack this right over the top. Yeah. All right, so does anybody think this will go higher than Mentos? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Actually, it has not been a very inspiring day for our mentor. I think they've been beaten on just about all fronts here. Right. Does anyone think it'll go higher than the spice drops? Yeah. I think there is perhaps a secret advantage that our lifesavers have, since I have to split them up to get them in here, which is that they've got a lot of exposed surface area to interact with the soda. Let's count down here. Like maybe we had more force going out there. We can see once this settles. There. One! There we go. <laughs> Alright. So that is our catalytic reaction.